Welcome to Just Men, a life-changing program that resonates hope as well as encouragement. The program that gives you information and inspiration for the glory of God. I'm your host, Jeff Tate, and thank you for joining Just Men. On today's program, we have a very special guest. It's his second time being on Just Men. We truly are blessed. We're inspired. We're already off set. have been talking, and I'll tell you, get ready for to be inspired and be encouraged. Joining us for our guest is Hollering Hilton Hill. Brother Hilton Hill. It's good to be back. Man, <laughs> it's good for you to be back. Yes, sir. Uh, wow, I tell you, we got a lot to talk about, and it's always encouraging just to hear, even offset. I wish that our audience could hear some of the things we talk right. about, but I want to really hit the ground running yes. uh, in terms of just where your mindset is and some of the things that you're teaching on. So where the Lord is moving you, and I know one of the things you and I talked about offset uh, in terms of just service. Mm, yeah. So, so I've, I've had a shift in my whole concept around work. I, I've spent the better part of maybe 20, 25 years studying the life of King Solomon, right? He's, he was the richest king. He was the wisest man to ever live. Uh, but by the time you get over to Ecclesiastes, and there's some debate about whether or not he was the author of Ecclesiastes, but um, most scholars say that he was the writer. He's this preacher that was a king. He says at the very beginning of Ecclesiastes, I'm the son of David and I'm a king, all that kind of stuff. By the time he gets to Ecclesiastes, he has fully adjusted or readjusted his life because here's the only thing you have to know about Solomon. When you read about him, it says Solomon was the wisest, richest man to ever live. But if you truncate the sentence, what you end up with is Solomon was. He could not outsmart God or outlast God. He is past tense. He ran into the one thing we all run into, which is death. He ran into the one thing we all run into, that at, at, the, at the very top of our wit, wisdom, we're just brushing up against the rough edges of God's infinite wisdom. So even though he had apportioned to Solomon this great wisdom greater than anybody, it still wasn't enough to even approach understanding God. And if you read Ecclesiastes, boom, it's right there. He goes, you know what? I tried everything. I went in every direction my wisdom would take me, and it didn't take me anywhere but back to God. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know what? The striving, the searching, it's all a grasping after, he uses the word vanity, but the Hebrew word is hevel, which means vapor or breath or smoke. And uh, we were in our little class, and I brought in a fog machine. And I said, this is million-dollar fog. I pumped the fog in the room, and I said, everybody grab a handful. And I said, if you can hold it until Monday, I'll give everybody in here a million dollars. <laughs> everybody stopped grabbing, and I said, why'd you stop grabbing? They said, grabbing. They said, that's stupid. You can't hold it. I said, but you're grasping after fame, and you're grasping after fortune, and you're going to come to the same conclusion. There's no there there. So why did God give us work to do if there's no there there, if the, if the work is not a means to an end? Work in and of itself, when it is done with excellence, has an ennobling quality to it. It makes you, it makes you better, and it also fills you with joy. And whenever you become excellence, there are two types of wisdom. There's level one wisdom, which is skill, Level one wisdom is the stuff of 10,000 hours. So you work for 10,000 hours at a craft or something and you start to approach mastery. And this is the type of skill that you can earn or learn. And then once you have facility with that skill, then you can apply it or apply it in your trade for your benefit or somebody else's benefit. Level two wisdom is when you go online with God's wisdom and you start to become a channel for a divine wisdom or insight or discernment that tells you how to use the skill that you have. It tells you as a musician what note not to play. You start to know the nuance. You start to understand the patterns of things. That level two wisdom is a gift from God. When, when God gives you that kind of skill and wisdom, it has to have a purpose. And so in my work, just studying Solomon's life and realizing that no matter how wise he was, he was, <laughs> past tense, and that his life didn't have any joy, 
when the wisdom didn't have purpose, I started saying, God, well, what do you want me to do? And he's like, I want you to be excellent for my glory, and I want you to be excellent so that you could be a channel to serve somebody else, period. Mm -hmm. That's the end game. There is no next level. Now, the funny thing is, a byproduct of sustained growing excellence is, seest thou a man diligent in his business? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before mean men. You can't help it. I mean, when you're best of class at something, you can't help it. It's the law of supply and demand. We've got a guy that's a excellent, he's the most excellent speaker on the planet. He's excellent by, birth, by virtue of the fact that he connects with people and that connection has a transformative power. And there are only 365 days in the year, but there are 10,000 people that want his time on that day. Can't help it. You know, the highest bidder may win. That's a byproduct, but that's not my aim anymore. My, my job is just to show up, bring the best of who I am to this moment to serve and to let that whatever God has given me channel through to bless and to serve you. And now it's just a blessing to feel God use you and to feel the, the presence of God flowing through you, especially a dirty vessel. You start to realize the honor in that, and, and it really does let the pressure off. So for me, I, that's just where my head and my mind is because I no longer believe that there's a there there. Mm. I believe that the only thing we have is this and then the life to come. And the life to come is really based on how present I can be with this, if that makes sense. Wow, that's beautiful. How does someone come to that understanding? How do they grab hold of what you just shared about this awakening, this level of consciousness about that there is no there there? Right. Uh, how do they come through that? And does they have to go through <laughs> some tribulation? Do they have to go through some divine revelation? I mean, get, put them sort of on the, 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 the road of Damascus uh, <laughs> kind of thing to where they come to a point of awakening. You know, most people come to it Either they fail really badly and they go, wow, after all of that, I end up here. Or they succeed by virtue of whatever their definition of success is. And when they, when they get that level of success, it just isn't satisfying. Mm -hmm. Right? And they go, this is it? This is it? I was listening to an interview with Russell Simmons, and he's got this book out about meditation and stuff. And... He was talking about the fact that you realize, so you get the Rolls Royce and you drive around the corner. He said the experience a lot of people have is they get great wealth. They get all of the things that they think will fulfill them. And you drive it around the corner and you park it and you go, that's it? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because when you get it, you need somebody to see you with it to, to get the affirmation that you thought was what you needed to prove that you've arrived. So I think the way you get there is you fail or succeed. And this is, this, is, this is kind of the track of Solomon's life. He said, I tried building cities. I tried studying wisdom. He said, but I also studied madness and folly. I went as low as I could go. And in every direction he went in, he couldn't get outside of God. He couldn't find something to do with his wisdom that would satisfy his soul. Probably the greatest revelation that I've had in the last year is this. So if we look at a chronology of Solomon's life, because he reigned for 40 years, if you look at a chronology of his life, they say that he became king about 14 years of age. It took about four years to eliminate all of the contenders to the throne. So Benaiah went out and got rid of everybody that, was, that would threaten him, including brothers. After about that fourth year, he starts to build the temple. His wisdom was apportioned to him on purpose. Remember, he asked for wisdom to know how to go out and in among the people and how to serve. His greatest objective in life was to build a temple for God, period. That's why he existed. That temple was an archetype of what Christ was going to do. This was all set up, right? So it takes seven years, roughly, to build this temple. Right before he builds the temple, when he asks God for wisdom, God shows up and gives him an assignment. He builds the temple, and he's worshiping in the temple, and God shows up again, right? 
So he has two visitations from God. So for every man that says, if God would just tell me what to do, I'd be straight. No, you wouldn't, <laughs> right? You would not. <laughs> the wisest man to ever live had two direct visitations from God and still couldn't get it right. He builds the temple, he finishes the temple, and then he started on the second half of his life or his reign. And the first thing he tries to do is build his palace. If you look at the specs of his palace, the specs of his palace are about twice the size of the temple. So he tried to make his house bigger than God's house. And from a directional standpoint, the first half of his reign, all of his wisdom was directed upward for a higher purpose. Second half of his reign, it was directed toward himself and his earthly things. And once his wisdom was disconnected from purpose, it became poison. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't make us skillful or great as men so that we can be enamored with our skill. He does it so that we can be sharp tools in his hand to serve, period. And the, and the, the, the breakthrough comes when you become satisfied with that. Your satisfaction with that is going to open you up to all the other things you think you may want. But if, but if you would just become the greatest man that you possibly could become and put that at the service of God, and if you would learn just the joy of, if you would learn to just enjoy the excellence, the, 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 the excellence that flows through you, just the feeling of that, the rest is gravy. Right, if, if, if that makes sense at all, the, re the rest is great. Wow, man, that's, you, you and I have talked off set in terms of enjoy. Oh, yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, so, so this, oh man, I get geeked about this. I get geeked about this. So, <laughs> so this is, we're hardwired for discipline and structure. Right, so you talk a lot about identity and uh, studying about DNA um, and this uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, th these protein structures we know as DNA. When, when, when the sperm fertilizes the egg and cellular division begins, so something has to tell each one of those cells what to be. So everything is everything. So. My fingernail is made of cells, but so is my finger. But this is hard, this is not. And that is because there's a code that says this should be this and this should be that. So there's an instruction set. So we come with instructions, right? We're wired for that. So there's a purpose and design inside of you from the minute your cells start to divide. There's something inside of you pushing you in a direction to become. Before you're even aware of yourself, before I knit you together in your mother's womb, I knew you. I know the plans I have for you, right? Mm -hmm. There are plans. So we, we come hardwired like that. Once you become self-aware, though, and you start to grow, then you start to play a role in this person you are becoming. You start to make choices. You start to make decisions. What I found in my personal life was I had a plan for work. I had a plan for certain things that I wanted to do in my life, but I didn't know how to live. I didn't have a design. And I certainly didn't have the level of joy in my life that I wanted. And I'm reading Solomon, and he burns through all of his ambition, and he gets to the end of himself, and he finds that there's nothing there. And then he says, you know what? You need to really be present, and you need to enjoy your life. So I was preparing for a, a speaking engagement, and <clears throat> I love words, so I took the word enjoy, and I broke it apart. So you got the word joy, a feeling of supreme satisfaction or whatever, but the prefix en means to make, cause, or create, right? Mm -hmm. So when you say enjoy, you're really saying make joy, cause joy, create joy. So when you have decided to enjoy your life, what you've decided is to move from a passive waiting for joy to fill your life to an active creation of joy in your life. So just like something was set forth inside of you, a set of instructions that deliver skin here and nails here, you start to become the architect of joy in your own life. 
And so I thought, you know what? I've never taken responsibility for my joy. And I've never even asked the question, what generates joy? Interesting thing is happening in the field of psychology. In psychology in general, they have studied dysfunction. So they've studied anxiety, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, all of this stuff. Why are we broken? What they hadn't done was studied people who were doing well. And what they found is that people who are doing well have a proactive approach to being well. There are things that they do, that they make, they cause and create that gives them a sense of well-being. So what was happening is people would stay in counseling, they would get a breakthrough on their issue, and they thought, well, this guy will be happy once he gets his breakthrough, and what he ended up was empty. Because the only thing he know how to use, knew how to use his energy for was brokenness. Mm. He had never applied his energy to blessedness, and he didn't even know what it looked like. Well, there are certain things that generate joy. Positive relationships, positive emotion, working with excellence on something that has meaning, not as a means to an end, but the value of the work itself and giving back. These are all generative of joy. Along with that, health. And most people who live with a high sense of well-being have decided that I am going to make, cause, or create joy. And they put together an agenda, a purposeful agenda in their life to generate more joy for themselves because joy is medicine, joy is strength. They took a group of people, you tell me if I'm talking too much, but they took a group <laughs> of people and uh, they cloistered them for seven days. They did full psychological and, and medical evaluations and they wanted to term, determine who were the positive, optimistic people, the negative, pessimistic people. They got a good read on who was who. Then they took, um, the spray thing, and they sprayed the rhinovirus into their noses to give them a cold. The negative people got sicker faster and stayed sicker longer. The positive people, their immune system rejected it, right? The joyful people rejected the cold. So the researcher wanted to know, no, 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 give me science. Tell me exactly what's going on. Negative people generate more of a protein called IL-6 or interleukin-6 which causes inflammation. Positive people generate less of it and suppress IL-6. It tr it's factual scientific truth that the joy of the Lord is your strength. So as you become proactive about generating more joy in your life, it raises your level of health and well-being and it positions you so that you can serve better. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, that's good. So that's <laughs> That's why the joy thing is just because I had never been intentional about it. Mm. I never I never took responsibility for it. I never said I always wanted to lay off. If there wasn't joy present in my life. I wanted to lay it off on somebody else, not realizing I hadn't invested anything to have joy, mm. nor had I decided to be an agent of joy in other people's lives. Mm. Wow, that's beautiful. You know, I got to carry you to another level uh, in carriage. Ooh, man. <laughs> So, so we got four words we're <laughs> yeah, working yeah, right, with, right, right, four right. words. Um, so you got enjoy, mm -hmm. right, based on that prefix in. And mm -hmm. by the way, how you prefix your words changes your words. Mm -hmm. So you take the word possible, if you put I am in front of it, it changes that word. Mm -hmm. You take the word do, and if you put un in front of it, it changes that word. Mm -hmm. So what you attach to your words has a big impact on it. So this prefix en is so powerful because it means to make, cause, or create. So when you say encourage, what that means is you have to make courage. And we need friends that encourage us more than we need friends that affirm us. Mm. See, somebody might affirm you in your weakness. Man, I, I feel sorry for myself, feel bad. And they go, you know, yeah. But somebody that encourages you they help you make the courage you need to face what you need to face. And every time you face what you need to face, it builds more courage. So every man needs an agenda for building courage. And he needs to be about making courage. So you have, here's David. We were talking about this off the air. David says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. 
There is no exemption in that passage. The presence of God does not exempt him from the valley walk. He's still got to walk it. But the presence of God encourages it. It gives him the courage to keep walking. So we all need that courage. Endure. So endure. Dura is the same root for durable. So when you endure, you make strong or make durable. Every man needs an agenda for strength, mind, body, and spirit. So you need to do the things that will strengthen your mind. You need to do the things that will strengthen your body. You need to do the things that will strengthen your spirit. And where does it show up? Well, it shows up in how you uh, spend your time and spend your money. So a guy that's trying to build strength, he needs to have a strength agenda that shows up. You need to be going to the gym. Um, you need to be reading things that strengthen your mind. You need to be spending time in the Word to strengthen your spirit. The last one is enhance. So enhance means to make better. So you give me a guy that has taken responsibility for creating joy in his life and, and has kind of put together um, a plan on a regular basis to reset his joy and to live with great joy. He's a healthier guy. You give me a guy that has an agenda for courage, he's more courageous. Give me a guy that has said, you know, over the next 10 years, I'm going to become the strongest person I can be, mind, body, and spirit. Then this guy is perfectly positioned to enhance every relationship he enters. Mm -hmm. He's excellent at what he does, but he's excellent at who he is. And so when he steps into the game, he's ready to make it better. That's why we exist, to enhance. That's what we're here to do. Everything else is, is vanity. It's, and, and this is the thing that when you started talking about this identity stuff, it really made me think. The reason you should become the very best man you could be, especially before you have children, is because you're coding into their DNA your essence. So you can either set them up to be great or you can set them up to struggle with your issues, mm -hmm. right? So I deal with the cumulative effect of generations of hills bringing me to this moment. I have strengths that have momentum, but I also have weaknesses that have great momentum, right? So we want to become great men so that that DNA code that they start from cellular, di cellular division with so that it has the advantage of a man that loved God and sought after God. And so you, you have an inclination for that. But then the environment that your children and the people around you live in, the kind of person that you are in front of them, has a shaping effect. So it's what you give them on the inside, but it's, what, it's the environment you surround them with on the outside that tells them how to be or it shows them how to be. And so you being a great man has very little to do with this little vapor of a life you're going to have. We got 7.1 billion people on this planet, and this planet has turned off billions. You're going to be here about 77.4 years if you're the average American male. If you make it to 80, you're in the bonus. But 80 years compared to billions of people, you probably won't be remembered. God remembers you, but... If you go to Washington, look at all the statues, and you're not going to see thousands of statues. You see hundreds out of billions of people. Only a handful get a statue and a song, right? Mm -hmm. So this little vapor you have, the best you can do is to show up in a way that kind of sends forward another great man or woman because you surrounded them on the outside with the presence of a great person inspired by God, not because you're great but because of God, what he does. But then you also maybe had the wisdom to put something on the inside of them so that they can lead that. So I get geeked wow. about this. Man, man. I, I, get, I, I can see I the passion, and up, I know man. you. there's a lot more. <laughs> this is only just a taste of, of what you have in terms of just the word in. I want to uh, pull on your heart in terms of why so many are struggling with the foundation hmm. of their lives. Uh, some are saying it's not happening fast enough that uh, endure, uh, not having that ability to, to see the fruition, to operate in the creative state that you talk about. So give a, um, some insight in terms of the type of foundation that people 
uh, need to understand in the building process of growth and right. increase. So if, you, so if you're going to just, if you're just going to have a mobile home, then we, all we need is a slab and we can tie that down, right? Mm -hmm. So you can tell if they just put down a slab, they're not planning to build something substantial. But if you decide to build a skyscraper, something that's got to be this tall, and by the way, when you build a skyscraper, the number one thing that, that hurts or, or threatens a skyscraper is wind. So what they have to do is if you want to go higher, you've got to go deeper. And you have to realize that when God wants to build you up, the first thing he has to do is put in a solid foundation. And it's a, it's a privilege when God says, okay, you're going to be a skyscraper. And here's the thing about the great skyscrapers of the world. People always ask, who was the architect? And that's what you want, is for God to build you up and not for people to go, Jeff's great. Who was the architect? <laughs> right? Yeah, All great. the engineers want to know about the foundation because they know you can't put it up high if you don't go deep. So we as men have got to get to the place where we're like, God, just move the dirt, put something in its place that, that I can anchor my life to, build me up so that somebody asks, who's the architect? I tell you, we don't have enough time. <laughs> and we're definitely going to have you back on. As I said before, you blessed us as always. Oh, man, thank you. And you're God's best. Last word of encouragement. Trust God with all your heart. Mm. There's no, you know, people, they say that the most that a person is present is three seconds before their mind goes either to the future with anxiety or the past with regret, mm. right? And the reason people feel empty is because you're never here. Your mind and your feet are in the past, or your mind and your feet are in the future. But if you could imagine a stick man and look at the center of his body, it's a cross. So if you take your mind and your feet out, there's a cross that covers the past. If you look in the future, you take his head and his feet off, there's a cross that covers the future. So because that has been taken care of, it's okay to be present right now around the cross. Trust that. Trust God. Lean on Him. He'll direct you. Wow. Stay focused. <laughs> brother, brother, Thank you, brother, brother, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. Peace.